We're gonna dive deep into bench press technique today and really cover all the things that I have not covered in my previous video when it comes to leg drive. If you haven't watched that video, I definitely watch that. That's gonna kind of precede everything we're gonna talk about today in the sense of looking at how we're going to initially work our setup to create the optimal position. Today, what we're really gonna dive into is first and foremost, we're gonna look at the biomechanics of the bench. Just like all the videos I do when it comes to the squat bench and deadlift, really want to understand what are the primary movers of this movement actually doing? Because that's gonna dictate the reason why we're, we're doing what we're doing in position and, and creating the most efficient uh, positions possible to create the best force output to put, these, to put these muscles in the positions where they're the strongest. Then we're gonna really look at the setup when it comes to grip and all the things that we're gonna to do to basically position the bar um, before then descending and talk about what we're gonna be doing during the, the descent to load the muscles properly, um, what we're gonna do during the pause to create the best pause position to create that solid shelf, and then looking at the press, what we're doing during the press to create the best bar path coming up and most efficient to lock out. And then at the end, just kind of a couple tips on kind of what um, we can do within training to kind of reinforce these. But first, let's really dive into what the primary movers of the bench press are doing within the movement. When we think of the bench press, we think of the pectoral muscles. They are the primary mover of the bench press, and while there's other muscles involved, they are really the key. They are, they are what's going to be doing the majority of the work when we're looking at the movement. Um, the pectorals, at their, their, at their function, their, they are internally rotating and adducting the arm at kind of a slight angle down. The reason why we tend to have a stronger bench press um, in a decline position for an incline as well as the reason for if you do some type of um, EMG testing, you're gonna have higher levels of pectoral activation at a decline because not only is it gonna internally rotate and adduct, it's gonna have a slight direction of coming down and across the body, which is gonna lead into a why we're gonna position our, our, our rib cage um, and torso to kind of get slightly into this decline uh, motion. A lot of people say, oh, we're going to arch, so we're going to decrease range of motion. That's part of it, but it's also partially to put the pectoral muscle in its strongest position possible. The next muscle is the triceps, and what I consider the second most important muscle within the bench press, because we're really, again, just looking at the function. We are adducting and internally rotating the humerus and then extending the elbows. That's the main function of what we're doing in the bench press of the tricep. Um, its main function that most people already know about is extending the elbow joint. The less known uh, function of it is stabilizing the shoulder joint. It's actually an extremely important scapular stabilizer. So um, the long head of the tricep, which is the inside, actually attaches to the scapula and shoulder blade. So it actually really is important with helping to stabilize that scapular position where the other two heads attach to the top of the humerus and that's more of the function of looking at extending the elbow along with the, the ability of the long head to do that as well. The third muscle is the anterior deltoid. And while the entire shoulder is involved in this movement, a lot of the other shoulder muscles and rotator cuff, rotator cuff muscles are in, in more of a function of anti-rotation, where the anterior deltoid helps to flex the arm. So in the bench press, most of the time there's gonna be some type of horizontal movement, meaning that we're not just gonna go straight up and down, there's gonna be some movement where the bar is gonna be coming maybe low on our chest, and as we press back, it's going to be coming up over our shoulders, and there's some slight flexion of that shoulder, and the anterior deltoid is the main factor of that. The anterior deltoid also works within the pec to internally rotate the shoulder. So it's working in the same function as the pectoral, pectoral muscle in internal rotation. Now with that, I will get to this a little bit later, but I think the anterior deltoid is a uh, muscle we actually don't want to use very much. It's very overrated, um, it is very weak, and while it's going to be used, and we have to use it, there's no way not to use the anterior deltoid, we want to limit the amount that it's being a primary mover because it's very weak at what it does in comparison to the pectoral muscle um, and the tricep, and we should focus more on loading those muscles to create the best and most efficient press versus loading that anterior deltoid. The final muscle that I'm gonna kind of put in that primary movers column that's a little bit more overlooked, and I think probably more recently has kind of brought, been brought to light, is the serratus. Those are kind of like little riblet looking muscles here, and they function to kind of uh, the forward rotation of the arms, but also the bigger is the wrapping and lateral, the wrapping around and lateral movement of the scapula, so protraction. And while you say, oh, I'm not trying to protract on a bench press, I'm trying to really retract and stay back here, there's going to be protraction. And it's going to have that serratus needs to be part of that movement as we press to have proper lateral scapular movement to help stabilize that shoulder joint to lockout. Because as we go to lockout, there's going to be an element of 
unretracting and protracting those shoulders and those, those, that scapula wrapping around our body to be the most efficient because our pectoral muscle rotates our arm around. So if that's gonna happen, that shoulder blade needs to follow with. If that shoulder blade's fighting against, it, it's acting as an antagonist. Um, if we're not allowing that shoulder blade to wrap with that pectoral bringing the arm around and adducting, it's going to constantly be pulling against it. Now, not only are we lifting X amount of weight, our pectoral is fighting against the, the shoulder blade, uh, those shoulder blade muscles, um, not allowing it to be able to move with it. And I do want to point out, notice there was one muscle I didn't mention, and that was the lats, because I think the lats are maybe the most overrated muscle um, on maybe any movement when it regards to the fact that people are so adamant that the lats are so important on a bench press. Um, to, to go dive into this even a little bit more, I'm going to link an article below in the description box um, from Greg Knuckles called um, Lats Much To Do It Out Nothing. Um, it's great and it really goes deep diving into this, but we need to understand what the lats do because they don't do anything in regards to what most people think. So one of the biggest things is the lats actually internally rotate the humerus. They attach to a point so that when we contract, they internally rotate. So it's just like if you were to do a seated cable row, it's much more natural for your elbows to spread out. I'm not saying you're trying to, but it's much more no, no, uh, natural for that than for you to externally rotate as you pull. It would be extremely difficult. It's because the lats don't function in external rotation. So this, this bend the bar and tuck your elbows in actually is to, to engage the lats is actually the exact opposite thing of what the lats are trying to function do. The only reason you, you kind of feel the lats is because you bring that humerus closer, which the lats are mainly in the abduction of the shoulder joint or adduction of the shoulder joint to bring it in, um, but they do not act in external rotation. They have no function here. They actually internally rotate, aka what the pecs are trying to do, but they are a very, I would say, weak internal rotator. They more aid the function of that. What the lats do in the bench press is they are a stabilizer of the scapula and a slight scapular depressor. Um, what that means is that, that while they attach to the inside of that humerus, they also attach a little bit to the bottom of the scapula and shoulder blade. And so they do work a little bit in scapular depression, but not so much. I mean, they have some function in shoulder depression because if you're going to pull at the humerus down and it's going to contract, it's going to kind of pull the shoulder down. But the main actual shoulder depressor, when we're thinking of shoulder depression, constantly preaching that, is the pec minor. If you were just to stand here real quick, reach your hands to the floor to kind of pull those shoulders down and press them. What you're gonna, you can even see it on the screen. What's happening is my pec minor is the main function of that. And you're gonna actually feel, if you really pull hard, you actually kind of feel it cramp because you'll, you'll crank down on that really, really hard on that pec minor. The lat isn't really doing much at all in that position. And with that, that's one of the reasons why when we're constantly trying to force the lats in to, to, to depress the shoulders, um, a lot of people nowadays, a very common issue, a lot of pec minor injuries because we're trying so hard to depress that shoulder and contract and bind down on that pec minor um, that we're, 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 we're going to the wrong uh, target to create that depression. We're gonna talk about a little bit later that elevation creates depression, not trying to make our lats, AKA our pec minor, create depression. <clears throat> so what are the lats doing? They're stabilizing, that's about it. I think that's probably the only muscle in any movement where people are constantly, that are just, it's just a stabilizer and it's, it's the antagonist of the primary mover, aka the pecs, the lats are antagonists of that. They're, they're working opposite of each other for the most part, minus the internal rotation. I think it's the only muscle of any movement that people are constantly saying lats, 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 lats on bench press, even though they have no function. Um, we don't say hamstrings, hamstrings, hamstrings on the descent of a squat, even though they have a function of stabilizing as we go down with the hip joint and the knee joint. Um, they don't do much in that sense. They, they are more a stabilizer. They are not a primary mover. So we should not be thinking the lats as a primary muscle from the group. Um, we don't do a row and say pecs, 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 pecs as we row. That, that would be silly. No one thinks about that. Um, we, we need to think more of our pecs and our triceps being the primary movers with the serratus and the anterior deltoids being kind of helpers of those and helping to create the function of what the shoulders wanting to do um, and finish the movement with that sense of flexion um, and the rotation and scapular um, lateral rotation. All right, so now that we understand the function of the primary movers and what muscles we're really trying to work in the bench press and what we need to do to create the most efficient positions possible to allow those muscles to, to create the most force output as possible, let's get into the setup. So before we even get onto a bench and kind of show you the setup, we need to understand grip, and this is gonna be a better view to be able to show that. So um, when it comes to grip, the number one priority is that we need the primary position where we're driving through to be the outside bottom of the palm. 
The reason for that is we need this stack position where we're driving straight through the elbow, through the wrist, into the bar. Just like if we're squatting, we need to drive through our midfoot. We want to create the best stability possible so we're not creating rotational forces. If that bar is too far back in our palm, it's constantly torquing us to external rotation. If our wrist is too straight, and a lot of times that's people think, well, I need to get my wrist really straight. Actually, that's a bad thing too. Your thumb's going to be supporting it and it's constantly pulling you into internal rotation. We need to create this position where we're actually stacking that bar directly over that elbow. And the only position we can actually achieve that in is if the bar is on the outside of the palm. Because so we can't achieve that here because no matter what, the thumb's in the way. We can't load the inside bottom of the palm. We're going to have to go through here. But the issue most people have is when they grip, they go through straight through the palm. And then that's gonna create this position where we're gonna have this torqued back wrist position. The bar is actually behind that ulna and it's gonna to torque us into external rotation. So what we need to do, some people call this the bulldog grip. I just really consider it the grip we're supposed to have is this slightly internally rotated grip. So what I usually do when I go to grab the bar is I'm gonna put my hands in position. I'll just use one hand here. And then from here, I'm just gonna slightly internally rotate until I, I'm pretending I'm below the bar right now getting set up, until I feel the outside of my palm driving into the bar. So I usually set up here first just so I can grab the bar where I need to slightly internally rotate to the point where I can feel the outside of my palm driving in and then I'm going to grip. And that's not excessive. Some people do a fairly excessive kind of bulldog grip or even Japanese grip um, where you, I'm not going to cover that in full, but if you look up Japanese grip, it's kind of a way to be able to extend where your pinky is and in, in where your index finger is in relation to max grip width. But for the most part, we are putting that bar in the center of our palm, internally rotating until we can feel the outside bottom of the palm driving in and then gripping from there so we can be able to stack that bar weight over the center of gravity of that forearm down through the elbow. So going along with grip position and creating that position with that bar stacked on the outside of the palm, one thing I do need to mention because it's so important is how to properly put on wrist wraps and it's unbelievable how many people don't utilize wrist wraps correctly. We need to actually cast the wrist joint. And if we do it correctly, pretty much it's going to put us right where we want to be. Like we, we won't be able to stint, extend back too far because this should cast our wrist. So understand the biggest mistake people make is that this is the, our wrist joint and then they wrap it below that. All that's doing is cranking down on our forearm flexors. And what you're kind of feeling a little bit from that is you're, when you, if you, if you can grab yourself right now if you just squeeze there, you can see that actually will flex my fingers. That's why like, I'm not a big fan of this. That's why some people wear wrist wraps on deadlift because if those are cranking down those forearm flexors or those finger flexors, um, those are going, it's going to make you want to grip. So that's kind of what you're feeling a little bit in the sense of why you think the wrist wraps are working, but they're really not. You have to cast that wrist. That doesn't mean go way high up though, because we also have to be careful because if we go, if we put this wrap right on the center of our wrist joint, it's gonna go up a little bit too high and we're gonna break the rules in the sense that that wrist wrap is gonna be touching the bar. So I like to think of one third of the wrist wrap is below, above the wrist joint and one third and two thirds is below. And that's gonna create the position so that we're able to cast that wrist joint, but not get in a position where we can't grip the bar correctly and are against the rules. And if I do that, you're gonna see here, that's as litter, as far as I literally can, uh, get away from my face so you can see it. That's as far as I can cock my wrist back. I can't go any further. And if I was to put a bar there, it would, it would be the perfect position for that bar to rest directly on the bottom outside of my palm to then stack directly under my elbow. Now I can go the opposite way, but really what I can do is I can kind of think of uh, extending my wrist into this position and not really care too much because I can't go any further. No matter what I do, I can't go any further back. That bar is gonna eventually just wanna rest where it wants to. So a lot of people who struggle with setting their grip correctly, it comes from the fact that they never set their wrist wraps correctly to just kind of naturally allow their wrist to sit in the position, position it should. All right, so let's actually get under the bar now. It's first off, I'm gonna show kind of how we apply what I meant with the grip. So not only do we need to create that position, but when should we do that? So the optimum, optimal time to be able to set your grip is I'm first going to get elevated on the way upper traps. I'm in position, my leg drive is engaged. The last thing I'm gonna do before I unrack the bar is internally rotate, grip the bar in the outer palm, drive the outer palm to un unrack, and then set the bar over my chest. So we want that to be the last thing we do because too often people make the mistake of setting their grip and then they shift around on the bench with their setup and then they undo their grip and they, they eventually lose the grip position that they had originally set up. Make that the last thing you do. The last thing I'll say with that too is make sure you grip the bar. Some people just kind of like have it just kind of daintily sitting in their hands. The fact of the matter is, is gripping the bar is very important in the bench press because 
your grip and the tightness of your grip creates an irradiation effect. If you just stand here right now and then squeeze your hand as hard as you can, you'll feel tension go all the way up through your arm, through your shoulder, through your upper back. Um, as we tense muscles, it tends to send up tension through muscles throughout the chain, which is actually something we'll talk about with the obliques and the serratus muscles later um, in this, this video. But grip the bar. It doesn't mean grip it to the point where your, your hands are turning blue, but make sure you have a good grip on it so it's creating that irradiation effect that's gonna help to basically tense up those shoulder stabilizers to help to be able to help give them um, improved activation to help to kind of keep that shoulder in a good position. So we've got our grip down, we've unracked the bar. This is where we typically kind of, before we lower our hips, we're trying to get everything set up. And this is typically where people kind of retract and depress. And while I'm putting that in quotations, we, we still need to do that, but understand the, the, the main way we create depression is through elevation. As our rib cage opens up, that just because of the natural rotation of our rib cage up and the thorax coming up, that angles the shoulders down. We're not trying to necessarily greatly pull the shoulders under because again, as I mentioned before, that's the pec minor. And if we're gonna cramp down on that, um, there's, there's two issues. One, I see a lot of pec minor issues from just kind of really forcefully trying to pull that pec minor down. And two, it's kind of like a squat. If we sit back too much, we're gonna have to go the opposite way. If we really crank down on that pec minor and everything and trying to press too much from those muscles, as we go to press, those are the people that we see the shoulder elevation happen as we get this internal rotation and that pec and that interior delta kind of pulls uh, and serratus kind of pulls us around. So if we go too much the opposite way, so too much depression, we're going to have, we're going to struggle with the fact that we're going to go too far the opposite way as we press. So we want to kind of be in between and we want to let that elevation create the depression. All right, so what do I mean by that? What is elevation creating depression? So what I mean is that we are going to get in position bar is unwrapped, and then from here, I'm creating leg drive to hold, to drive up through my torso to elevate my rib cage up. And what that is doing is I'm trying to basically stay on my upper trap, that, that those legs are driving to that rib cage, elevating the rib cage, and then if I'm creating this horizontal tension in the bench to trap my upper traps in the bench, it's also trapping my shoulders. It's not allowing my shoulders to elevate because my shoulders are being pulled down from that horizontal tension of the bench. So you can see here, I don't have a great arch by any means, so I'm not the world's greatest example of showing this, but if I'm flat, my shoulders are in a different position in relation to my thorax than if I elevate. Right here, my shoulders are just in line with my shoulders. They are not under my chest by any means. If I use my legs to elevate my rib cage, roll up on my own traps, which naturally depresses my shoulders. Now, I'm over my shoulders right now with the bar, but the bar is actually over kind of my mid chest. Here, it's over my shoulders, because we need to start over our shoulders. To have, to have our arms straight up and down, the bar instead has to start over where our shoulders are. It can't start over our chest, or else we're actually gonna have our arms angled oddly. So we create that, so instead of here, right now I, the bar is over my shoulders, I create this elevation, my bar is over my shoulders, but also it's in direct angle of coming down to my chest. So I've created depression through elevation without ever trying to cue some type of depression through my lats, which isn't happening, or really clamping down that pec minor, which eventually is gonna release as I go and press and create elevation. The last thing with our setup is understanding how to breathe and brace. And on the bench press, it's very different because understanding on the bench press, we're actually trying to lengthen the abdominals. Unlike the, and, and we're not finding neutrality, we're trying to bias towards extension um, with that rib cage elevation, the lower back extending. Um, so we're not trying to brace our abdominals and do this Valsalva maneuver where we're trying to kind of um, brace our, our, our spine. What we're actually trying to do is breathe to expand our rib cage. So exactly the opposite of what you do in a squat. A squat, you say, don't chest breathe. On a bench press, you are saying chest breathe because that rib cage expansion is going to open that rib cage up and create this more barrel chested position. So what we want to do is, I personally prefer breathing after unracking. The only reason for that is it depends on what federation you're in or the judge, head judge that day. Um, if you breathe before you unrack, and that's when you brace and you don't ever brace again, you might be holding your breath for 10 seconds. And I've had many a lifter pass out. Um, now, I've heard um, 
Some lifters kind of argue that, and I think it might be dependent on possibly the, the, the amount of weight they're handling, uh, which I can very well see the reasoning for that. If, if you're benching 600 pounds, you might need to be more specific in bracing beforehand. But for a normal person, we want to not hold our breath for 10 seconds. It would be like the same as, as squat of, it, we, we breathe and brace during the unwrap, and then we never breathe and brace again before squatting. We eventually kind of get start getting lightheaded. So we might breathe and brace here, but the main part we're doing that on is after we get in position, we're elevated, leg drives on. Now right here, before we descend, the last thing we do, we breathe and expand into that rib cage as the final thing when we brace before then descending in it. So that can create even more elevation by expanding that rib cage. So a very under talked about muscle on the bench press is the obliques. And it does two main things. It's one, it's helping to control the rib cage, even though we're trying to elevate and it's lengthening that oblique, we still don't want to lose context there. I call it the floating rib cage if we, if we kind of lose context with the obliques, because the obliques are going to kind of help with that lateral stability. And lateral stability is very underappreciated on the bench press. We think more just we need to drive strip and down. The fact of the matter is, is if you don't have lateral stability and you're shaking back and forth, that's going to create a lot of issues. Those obliques help to control that. As well as it's been shown that oblique activation then increases activation of the serratus. So I kind of look at that as a chain going up, just like the irradiation effect from the grip. Activation of the oblique leads up to that serratus, which is going to help the activation of that serratus as we press through with that forward rotation of the scapula. So what I mean by that is how you can kind of tell if you're, you're having issues with the obliques. Um, what I typically see is one side floating. And what I mean by that, I'm gonna try and mimic this. So what you'll see is you'll see some of this elevated ribcage position, but one side will be, will be floating up while the other side is a little bit more depressed. And that's meaning that oblique is off. And what I, it's not off per se, but it's, it's not doing its job of kind of make sure, just making sure to kind of uh, stabilize that ribcage. Usually where that's leading from is the feet. So the fact of the matter is on the bench press, um, our hip anatomy plays into our foot placement. If you look at 10 benchers, probably nine out of 10 minimum um, are gonna have asymmetrical foot position. Their feet are not gonna be perfectly straight. And because of that, we tend to be a little bit shifted on the bench. And I don't put too much worry into that, but that can change our foot pressure. If you drive one foot in the bench, you can see as soon as I do that, I'm just driving my left foot in. I guess you can't see that. As soon as I drive my left foot in, that activates my left oblique and pushes me off to the right. If I'm not evenly driving with the right, I'm not going to be centered. So if my right's soft and my left isn't, it's gonna clamp down and send this irradiation effect from the driving to the floor to my oblique to my serratus. And my right side, I'm showing my left is one driving, my right side is gonna be less tension. So we really wanna make sure if you're seeing this kind of floating rib cage position where obliques are not where they should be and not kind of having tightness in context, um, it's usually coming from the legs. And that should be fixed by having proper leg drive, which again, I covered in that first video I made on bench press called the complete drive, complete guide to leg drive. So um, if you're seeing that floating rib cage, I'll kind of show again here. In this position, right now I'm driving with my right, so you, most likely my left rib cage is, is floating. Once I drive with my left, I get both feet in there it starts to even that out. So hopefully that was visible on camera, but um, just really note that if you see one rib cage flaring and the other isn't, you're most, it's usually gonna do a couple things. It's one, it's gonna create instability. Two, you're usually gonna see that on the side that the, the, rib, that the rib cage or the oblique is contracting better. You're actually gonna kind of um, feel like you're over retracting and you're gonna see the bar kind of tilt that way. Um, and again, a lot of people are like, oh, I need to retract more on one side or I need to retract less on this. And usually it's stemming from the feet, not controlling the obliques, not controlling the serratus muscles. It's always, it's going up that chain. So the last point I'm gonna make when it comes to setup is don't over retract. Um, the fact of the matter is, is when we're over retracting, it's going, the biggest thing it's gonna force is one, it's elongating the pecs, which is putting them in a different position. But two, um, we are trapping ourselves in the retraction um, and kind of trapping our shoulder blades in a position where maybe we don't want them to be. But even erasing all that, the single biggest thing is you see a lot of people that say, oh, I can't lock my elbows. No, you're just retracting too much. You're forcing too much retraction. What you'll even see is they'll have too low of a rack height position. They'll go unrack in this ultra retracted position. They'll get super retracted, they'll unrack, and they put their hips down like, oh, I can't lock my elbows. And literally right there, I was cramping up in that. The reason they can't lock their elbows is because their scapula is so pulled back that it's pulling at that and they can't extend the tricep. Because do you remember what I said about the tricep? The tricep attaches to the 
scapula. So if the scapula is ultra retracted, we're not going to be able to extend the elbow because of what's happening back here. And that's going to actually, uh, it's a, a lot of issues with shoulder pain, a lot of times it leads back to that, that tricep being bound back and it, this tricep trying to fight to be able to kind of rotate that scapula forward by that tricep or, uh, extending the elbow. And we get into this again, this, this play back and forth where one muscle is trying to do something, the other muscle is trying to do the other thing, and they just fight and neither of them wins and they just force more work on it. So, key to that, be very, very diligent about locking your elbows. And locking your elbows when you start, locking your elbows when you come out, and then you can elevate with your elbows locked. And that's gonna put you in a great position. Um, and not only for the fact of biomechanics and the bench press, but also to get a start command. I mean, you need to get a start command on bench press to be able to actually get a uh, three white light bench. So we need to understand how to lock the elbows. So I'm not saying use a super high rack height where you have to protract and round out. What I'm saying is be very diligent that I'm going to, when I go to unrack, I have a little bit of bent elbows right now because I want to make sure this rack height so I don't have to protract. I just kind of do a light press and come out. And you'll see that here. I don't have to protract at all. I'm in position. I press, I come out, I kind of, I, with my elbows locked, I can allow retraction, but without unlocking my elbows. So when I unlock my elbows, I can allow excessive retraction. So I lock my elbows, let my shoulders sink in place, hips are down, and press. That's not the one that's gonna allow me to get my start command, but it's also gonna put me in the best position possible to allow the muscle to function correctly without antagonists trying to fight too much against them. All right, so we've covered this up. We've got our grip. We understand that elevation creates depression. We're in charge of our obliques by through our leg drive. We're making sure to keep our elbows locked. So now we need to descend. And the importance is that we've created a position where the, the descend should be very simple. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that the main thing we are doing as we descend is we are letting that bar come down and pressing through. Um, and what I usually cue for this is the first movement should be break at the elbows. Too often, it's shoulder extension. And what I mean by that is we too often see this. It's very slight. We see this kind of horizontal lowering of the bar, and then the elbows break with. And that's going to load the anterior deltoid, which again, I've got to mention in the beginning, we don't want to load the anterior deltoid. It's going to be a mover within the bench press. It's going to be used. We want to limit as much as possible because we want to limit unneeded horizontal movement. Now, on the bench press, there's going to be some horizontal movement. You'll, you've heard probably the J curve, that the bar comes down and there's a J curve coming back up. We want to, in a sense, limit that, at the same time take advantage of it. More likely what you're going to see is more of a vertical descent and then a J curve coming back up as we press over the shoulders because what's happening is we're in this elevated position as we go to descend, so bar path is mainly vertical coming down. As we go to press, we start to protract, and so the bar has to come back and up over our shoulders since we're getting out of this elevated position to an extent. We're protracting a bit to allow those shoulders to come around so that those arms can rotate and uh, adduct around the body, internally rotate, and allow the pecs and the triceps to do their job. So how I cue this, I've already kind of alluded to it, is I think break at the elbows. Let the elbows drop to the floor. Let the back of the dry, triceps drop to the floor. Anything that's gonna help to create the initial movement be more vertical. So what I mean by that is, as we position, my touch point's kind of that upper part of your sternum, lower part of your chest. That could change for most people what I'm using for my example, it's kind of that upper sternum, about my nipple line. So I'm in position. Right here, because of that elevation, that bar is pretty much over my touch point. So I don't need to extend my shoulder and in a sense tuck my elbows and create this horizontal movement, or else I'm going to touch too low, which then requires more horizontal movement coming back up. I want more to break at my elbows and let my elbows drop to the floor so I have that higher touch point, and then as I press, Naturally, I'm going to have this kind of flaring and bar path this J curve back up, which I'm going to cover more in a bit. So I'm really thinking about elbows, elbows break, triceps, or the elbow drops to the floor. And I also, if someone really struggles with tucking their elbows, I'll kind of say break the elbows towards the plate because that's going to kind of cue them to. I don't want to say flare because we're not necessarily trying to flare our elbows. That's that's that's. People think elbow flare is bad. The fact of the matter is, like I said, the pec internally rotates. If we're externally rotated, we're lengthening the pectoral muscle. If we're internally rotated, 
we're letting that pectoral muscle work more in the position it's the strongest in. So we're not trying to flare, because a lot of times people think flaring equals elevation. We're trying to allow this elevation of the rib cage to create depression, and then from there, keep that internally rotated position and a more vertical bar path going down so we load those pectorals and those triceps to then put them in the optimal position and then press from that position. And I kind of already alluded to it there, but that's why I, I, I can't stand the cue, bend the bar. Um, now, if you're a multi-ply lifter, that cue has a completely different meaning because you're using a bench suit, it's, it's a bench shirt, it's completely different. I, I don't want to get into that, but that is a different sport, a different movement. You are allowing a shirt to be now this added muscle that changes the biomechanics of the movement. We are raw bench pressers, and that's who I'm speaking to within this video. So if we're trying to bend the bar and create this external rotation torque to get on your lats, you're really not doing that. What you're doing is you're creating this tucked elbow position, which I already said the lat internally rotates. It doesn't externally rotate, so it's actually not getting on the lats. And you're creating this position where the elbows are going to constantly be inside the bar now. So I mentioned before, not only are we trying to create this vertical path and kind of this elbow straight down um, for positioning of the pectoral and the tricep, we're also doing that to make sure we're constantly loading that bar over the wrist joint and over the elbow joint. I'm keeping them stacked so that I'm able to press through bone. Um, now, obviously, we're using muscle, but if we can press through bone, we're going to be much better at producing force. If we're having to be uh, in an externally rotated position, our rotator cuffs are having to be at a, a very high demand to, to, to fight rotation of the shoulder. So if I'm going to tuck my elbows and bend the bar, what's going to happen is my elbows are going to be out in front of the bar. And so they are not allowing the forearm to be this direct vertical load down that forearm bone. I'm instead having to go through this angular motion at the shoulder joint to then have to stabilize that when the bone could have been doing that. We want the bone to be able to do some work. And I know that kind of sounds weird to some because we know everything about loading the bone on movements. That's exactly what we want to do to help that be a passive stabilizer versus always having to actively stabilize these little small rotator cuff muscles. The last thing I'm really thinking about during that descent, and this is going to kind of lead into our next point to pause, is first, I'm just going back to the grip, I'm really trying to think about feeling that weight on the outside of my palm as I descend. Just like the, the, your, the outside of your palm, that's our direct place we're driving force into the bar, that's the same thing as thinking of our feet into the floor. It's the only direct connection to where the transfer of force is occurring. The outside of our palm of the bar is that transfer of force occurring. So we want to have a connection there. Just like you wouldn't ignore your, your footing on a, on a squat, you don't want to ignore your hand uh, displacement on the bar. So as I'm going down, I'm constantly thinking of holding position through leg drive, but I'm constantly thinking of outside of my palm is feeling that bar as it goes. And I'm lowering to the outside of my palm. Just like on a squat, I feel my midfoot, I lower in my midfoot, I lower in my midfoot, and I drive through my midfoot. Bench press, lower in my palm, lower in my palm, lower in my palm, drive through my palm. Um, it's a, if you did a push up right now, you would think that because it's a bit more obvious because you are feeling the floor and then driving through the floor. But we need to think about the bar just being like the floor on a push up. We need to think about our palm coming down with the pressure onto it and then driving through it because that's the exact place where we're displacing the force into the bar. Um, the only other thing that's going to kind of lead to the next point is really thinking about as I'm doing that, I'm constantly driving the legs up to continue to elevate the rib cage to meet the bar. And that's where we're kind of kind of think of reaching the bar to the reaching the chest to the bar, which again, that's gonna lead to our next point. So let's get into it. We've talked about the setup, we've talked about the descent. Now let's talk about the pause, which is the next part of the bench press. So um, what I'm really thinking as that bar is coming down, like I said, I'm feeling the outside of the palms as they're coming down. I'm really thinking about using those legs to drive and elevate that rib cage to have that rib cage, sternum, chest stop the bar. This is again going back to why I, I just I don't like the thinking of lats. People say pull the bar to you. That is a multi ply trick. You, in a multi ply suit, you literally have to pull the bar to you. So the lats are actually kind of important. On a raw bench press, we don't want to pull the bar to us. We want to. It's the exact opposite. We want to be. We're fighting that bar coming down and then pressing away. If we pull the bar to us, we're going to create this this collapse of the chest, which creates external rotation, which creates the thoracic flexion, 
and then we're not able to get as good a position, and then we lose tension, and then we're in this heave mode, which I'm gonna cover why that's so dangerous and not efficient later on. So we really want to be thinking throughout the movement, we are driving our legs to elevate our rib cage up to stop the bar. And since if I'm leg driving correctly, I should be able to let go of the bar and it sits there and nothing changes. I don't sink from it. It's driving and pushing up to that bar to stop it. So less about pull the bar down to you, more about using those legs to reach the chest up to stop the bar from wanting to go down. And that right there is gonna create our retraction. So instead of cueing retraction, we're creating retraction through the leg drive and that chest reaching up because the reason for that is if our chest and rib cage reaches up, that's creating room for things to sink below it. If we are instead pulling the bar to us to retract, we're trying to somehow retract into the bench with no room to do it. So hopefully that made sense. So if things are elevating off the bench, it's creating room for things to come under, aka our scapula, to be able to, to retract, which then allows, again, room for it to, to protract our serratus to pull it around laterally as we press through. With that, I'm a big fan of more of a, a soft touch versus a sink method. And while we can do more of kind of a hard pause where we let it, like I said, if we're using leg drive correctly and reaching our chest to elevate our ribcage up to the bar, we can in a sense kind of let that bar, have, uh, that chest kind of take a brunt of the load as we pause and kind of release tension. At the same time though, I don't like that. We are trying to load that movement with our pectorals and our triceps and our arterial deltoids to explode back up. It's like a rubber band. We are loading this rubber band to explode back up. If we had this rubber band and all of a sudden we release tension off of it and just kind of and, we, and then tried to re-engage tension, we don't get the same stretch reflex. Um, we can some people kind of get that heave effect and they use leg drive to kind of propel it and then they get a little bit off the chest and then they re-engage. I prefer more of a thinking of a soft touch. It, it there's not only is it going to uh, load our muscles and keep the tension on the pectorals and the triceps and the anterior deltoids, it's also going to be probably safer come meet time and getting a pause command. Um, a big reason a lot of people don't get a faster pause command is because they get down to their chest and they're like, I'm pausing. Well, no, you're not. That bar is still sinking. The bar has to come to a complete stop. If it is continually slowly sinking into your chest, that's not a complete stop. And so until it stops, you are not going to get a press command or should not get a press command. So it's a very uh, dangerous technique sometimes with wanting to get a faster press command to allow this constant sinking to the chest. So more so, I think of like if a complete soft touch, like a t-shirt touch bench press, where you just barely touch your t-shirt, let's call that 100% tension. So we have t-shirt touch, 100% tension. We have bar completely resting at 0% tension. I like to think 50%. Let the chest take 50% and then let's still hold 50% in our hands, our triceps, our chest to create a lot of that tension so that as we drive, we are already still engaged and we can kind of press through that. So not allowing that chest to sink down, but really fighting that rib cage up to stop the bar, hold it in position while we hold it there with our hands and then drive through. The last thing we'll look at with the pause is why I don't recommend the really hard sink and heave style that we see a lot. Um, we have to understand that, that the people that work sport decently well are big, super heavyweights. And that's okay for them because they're so big circumference wise that their touch point doesn't even come close to the end range of their pec. So they kind of, it, it's, it's like us doing like a normal person like me as 190 pounds benching off of a two board. Um, I don't, if, if I could do that, it would be a lot easier to sink and heave because I never truly go to the end range of my, I would never truly go to the end range of my pec range motion. Um, for me, if I and most people who are more normal size that try and get into this sink and heave, we have to understand what when you change that rib cage angle, you're also changing the relation of the shoulder joint to your rib cage and chest and pecs and everything as well. Uh, what's happening is you're externally rotating. Um, when we go from this elevated position to the sinking position, even though it looks like our, our elbows are internally rotating because we go like this and we kind of dump the bar forward, we have to understand that our, our rib cage is going even faster in that direction. So we get through this external range of motion, um, external rotation range of motion of the shoulder, which then stretches the pec further. Um, I've had, I think, three people I coach currently who had pec tears prior to working with me. Every single one of them did a heat style bench press. 
Two of them in particular told me there was no way they ever thought in their entire life they'd ever bench more rest more than one day a week because they still have pec pain. Both of them are benching twice a week, no issue, more volume than they ever have by maintaining this elevated ribcage position to maintain more internal rotation. So they never actually stretch their pec to the end range of motion because a tear is most likely going to happen when we pull that pectoral past its ability of range of motion and tensile ability to hold that position. So when we allow this heat position and we go into not only basically letting tension off, but also external rotation and then try and drive through that, we're putting that shoulder and that pectoral in a very inefficient position, a very weak position because the, the most elongated position is the weakest position, also the shortest, the, the shortest, the most contracted and the most elongated are the weakest positions. Um, so when we're in those elongated position, we try and press through that, that pec is very weak. Um, and we just, it, we just took it from a position where it was strong and it could press from to a position where it's not strong enough to press from. We overload that muscle's capabilities. We hear a pop, we tear a pec. I'm not saying it's always gonna result in a tech pair, tech pec tear, but most people you see that tear a pec are from that key style bench press where they allow this, this rotation of the shoulder, um, this rotation of the rib cage in relation to the shoulder. Um, and that's putting the pec in a very inefficient pressing position. So we've got the setup, we've got the descent, we've got the pause. All we have left now is the press. So when we're looking at the press, we have to understand that everything we did during the descent and the pause is then going to create the, the actual press. We are loading all these muscles like a rubber band. So if you watched my squats video, you saw this exact same uh, display. But if I had this rubber band and I pull straight down on it, it's going to come straight back up. If I pull on it and it has a slight change in direction, it's going to come up at an angle. On a bench press, I'm not going to say it, it, it never happens, but we usually don't have a straight vertical press. It has a slight press backing up. And the reason why is because we're in this, this elevated position as we're coming down and we're over our sternum. And then as we press, we kind of, like I said, protract, we slightly depress our ribcage a bit, and we have to end over our shoulder. We don't end over our chest, we end over our shoulders because that's the natural position. It's the same thing if you did a push-up. You're going you're gonna to press to the point where it's over your shoulders. So it's usually this slight J-curve. We want to limit that though. We don't want to force a J-curve. Just because there is that J-curve with that kind of backing up, we don't want more of that because we don't want a lot of horizontal movement. Um, we want to create vertical force. We don't want to have to worry about horizontal force because that horizontal force, that's going to be on that interior deltoid. Like I said, that's a really weak muscle. So if we're touching really low and we have to have this, this high, this, this big press back, we're going to struggle with it, which is why you see so many times people get into this position. They over tuck, they press, they get stuck here, and then maybe they'll rotate their elbows out then they finish through because they're, they're fighting so hard with those interior deltoids to create that horizontal movement back that that's not strong enough. We want to be as quick as possible to get that bar back over our shoulders so it's just triceps and chest to lockout, not interior deltoids have to go to lockout. So what we do going down helps to lead to that. And so kind of what we want to do is even though that elbow wants to be directly under the palm, if we're just slightly forward, that's okay. And the reason why is because we definitely don't want to be behind. If we're behind, that makes it very hard. If we're under or slightly in front of it, that's going to create a position with that elevated rib cage that as we drive that elbow in the hand, there is a natural position where we're driving back. And the reason it's okay to even just have the elbow directly under is because with that elevated rib cage position kind of decline up, we naturally kind of press back because of that position, because we're kind of inclined with that rib cage. But like I said, it, maybe if we don't have as much of an incline um, with our an elevation of the rib cage or a bit flatter, we might need to have those elbows just very, very slightly track inside of that hand position. So as we press, you can see that forearm is already angled to press straight into a lockout position. Whereas if we're here, we're kind of having to fight to externally rotate to get back over the bar. So with that, I don't really ever cue anymore the idea of press back and then up. I don't want lifters that forcefully press back. Um, it, it usually leads to this elevation as they're trying to kind of force everything up and they elevate their shoulders and shrug to press because they're thinking too much of press back and up. I don't want to cue that. 
I want everything we talked about with the setup, the descent, and the pause to just create that position. That's why the, the press part of this video is very simple. Because if you did everything else right and you just drive through, it's going to come into place. Like we already loaded all the muscular correctly to be able to end the movement where we want it to and create this natural kind of slight J curve coming up. So while, I, while I'm not diving in the deep of what we should do while pressing, it's because there's not much we need to do. It's just like on a squat. If we load a squat correctly going down, we don't think about much going up other than drive the feet to the floor and drive up and maintain our position. Um, it's the same thing on a bench press. If we load everything right coming down, as soon as we press, everything is usually going to come into place and the bar is going to come back and up correctly um, because we're not inducing too much horizontal movement um, and we're not internal, externally rotating the elbows and tucking them in. Um, most people who you find that really need to force the bar back and up, it's because they're touching too low, it's because they're tucking the elbows, um, it's because they're loading the anterior deltoids, they're positioning the bar in a place where they can't actually press from, so they need to shove their, elbow, their shoulders up and shrug them to get that bar over their shoulders to lock it out. If we do everything right on the ascent, the ascent takes care of itself. So after looking at the full breakdown of mechanics with the bench press and all of the technique that goes into all aspects and phases of the bench press, uh, the last thing I really want to cover is, is just some general tips for training the bench press. So let's dive into those. So um, first and foremost, um, treat every rep like a single. Um, that's the, I can say that for squat, I can say that for deadlift. Um, it, this is powerlifting. We train to uh, produce force and produce maximal strength at a one rep max. And even though we don't do that on a daily basis, we have the ability to practice it. Every warm up, every repetition, we need to treat every rep like it's a single, even if it's a set of nine, which means making sure we're resetting position, making sure we're resetting to be able to, to have that bar position where it needs to before we descend, making sure that grip's correct, making sure we're initiating leg drive, making sure we're elevating the rib cage to depress the shoulders, all that stuff, every rep, not just up and down like a bodybuilder. So be really, really mindful of really trying, trying to create, make each rep at, uh, in, in like a single instead of thinking repetitions. The next thing if you're a power lifter is train with pauses. Um, I'll say for the people I program for, I would say at least 90, probably more like 95 plus percent of their work is paused. I, I don't really program touch and go too much. And even if I do, uh, like if they're doing a set of eight or nine on bench press and I wanna, I wanna take out some of those pauses just for, to make it a little bit easier on them, I'll probably do like a two, one, zero bench press, which means the first rep is a two second pause, second rep is a one second pause, and the reps three through eight or three through nine are touch and go. Um, the fact of the matter is touch and go is a different style of bench press than a pause. A pause requires a different control of leg drive, it requires a different control of elevation of the rib cage to stop that bar. Um, and if we're not training that, we're not training the skill of pausing, or we're not training the skill of leg drive, we're, we're gonna notice that when we come back to it. You'll see so, I mean, you see so many times these people just constantly do touch and go, they get to, they get to a meet and now they're 10, 15 kilos less on their bench press and they're all of a sudden shocked. Well, not only were they not training a pause, they weren't training the pause length that they needed to that was uh, competition style specific. So um, as well as there's, the, I mean, if physiologically and neurologically, there's a difference in kind of how we're in sense we're, we're decreasing that stretch reflex effect by pausing and not having this immediate stretch reflex back. So all of it kind of lines up into that. If you are a power lifter, you should be training with a pause the vast majority of the time. Uh, the last key I'll give for bench press is probably more so than any of the other lifts, it is very hypertrophy, hypertrophy dependent. Um, you won't find anyone who has a big bench press usually unless they're doing some significant cutting or range of motion with their arch um, that doesn't have a big upper body. I mean, that usually coincides. Um, that not only is because that's going to give a higher ceiling of potential for those muscles and their strength capacity, but unlike the other two uh, uh, movements, there is a direct change in range of motion by being bigger. Um, that's why we tend to see more dramatic changes in strength from weight gain and weight decrease on a bench press than the other list. Because if we are changing the circumference of our chest and our upper body, we are then changing the range of motion. Um, on the squat and the deadlift, that's not the same. The only time that kind of comes into play is if uh, you see like super heavy weights on a deadlift not being able to get in position because of, of hip flexion, of not being able to get to a range of motion they can, but that's, that's more of a negative impact. Um, within uh, bench press, there is almost always a positive impact with weight gain when it comes to uh, the bench press. And that mainly comes from the fact that um, we are decreasing range of motion through a bigger circumference of the chest. Um, that means not only gaining fat, but muscle is probably the better way to do it because we're not only gaining circumference on the chest, we're gaining the potential for a higher ceiling of output. So um, if there's one movement that's gonna require more hypertrophy, it's going to be bench press. So I mean, I. Most people probably already do this, but you're probably gonna have more accessory work for the upper body than you will lower body. Um, the, the deadlift and the squat do a decent job for the most part of creating the needed hypertrophy for um, 
what is needed with the squat and the bench or deadlift. For bench press, we're gonna see a lot more uh, uh, accessories, especially for people who have higher arches and limiting range of motion. Um, range of motion is one of the biggest correlating factors for hypertrophy. So things like dumbbell bench press to get a really good stretch, doing more variations on bench press like a Larson or a close grip bench press to increase range of motion is very beneficial. So just really, really making sure we prioritize hypertrophy in the long run for bench press and not just prioritizing strength alone. If you made it this far, thank you very much. I hope you appreciate it and, and got something out of all the, the aspects we, I put into this video when it comes to maybe hopefully having a better understanding of the mechanics of what the primary movers are doing, um, looking at kind of what you could take from the, the setup, the, the descent, the press, the pause, things that I talked about there and kind of understanding how we can in, put those into our bench press and improve your form. Uh, and if you feel like you got something out of this video, make sure to subscribe, make sure to like it, make sure to comment. If you have any questions, share with some friends, um, show your support and appreciate you watching. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>